Okay. So, okay, I would like to okay, say a few words about, okay, uh, finding deep bugs in software. Okay. So, okay, I would like to share with you, okay, a story. Uh, okay, uh, okay. Okay, Sao Ming okay, has a brother doing PhD at HKUST, like you. And, okay, uh, what he find, okay, from, learn from his, uh, okay, elder brother is that every time, uh, on the day before the programming assignment that night, his okay, uh, brother suddenly becomes a, a great player. Okay, so, Samin learns, and so okay, he also played. Okay, this time, okay, what he played, okay, he wants, okay, when it becomes Lao Ming, okay, one day, he does not need to play like his brother. Every time, okay, when programming assignments are get due, Instead, okay, this is the dream of, okay, uh, Lao Ming, okay, Sao Ming. When he think, okay, when he becomes, okay, Lao Ming, and he will be able to lead a good life, a PhD life, especially at HKUST. So whenever, okay, he, uh, okay, this is a picture of Lao Ming. Uh, okay, uh, when he, okay, whenever he write the program, okay, somebody would help him to uh, write the test and even more. Okay, uh, somebody could help him to find where his code got wrong, and furthermore, okay, even fix the, the bugs for him. And okay, this is the life that he would like to make at HKUST. And okay, this, okay, uh, give an introduction to my research areas. And okay, my research areas is uh, fault analysis and detection. Um, then, okay, fault diagnosis, and for repairing. So what I'm going to do is, okay, I try to um, share with you uh, two of my recent work with my students, and then, okay, a grand challenge. Uh, Android, okay, is a very popular uh, platform, and that of course, okay, we, um, okay, try to analyze, okay, the performance bugs of Androids. So what we did, okay, last year is to analyze popular Bugs, okay, sorry, popular, okay, Android apps, especially those with a lot of complaint by users on, okay, performance issue. And what, what we did is, okay, we analyzed the execution profiles of those Android apps, including, okay, uh, what these bugs are, how these bugs, okay, um, man manifest and, okay, debugging effort. And then, okay, uh, we develop a detector, and okay, the detector applies to uh, 29 okay, popular open source Android apps, and uh, we find okay, uh, 122 uh, unreported issues. And so, look, we report to the original uh, developers of this Android app to see they they like our results, and okay, uh, 64 of the uh, reports have been immediately confirmed by the developers, and we also received their feedbacks. So, okay, they like it, they want, okay, our, 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 our tools. And, okay, in fact, okay, this is uh, also incorporated into the Android Studio. Do you know Android Studio? So, Android Studio basically is, okay, the de facto platform nowadays used for, okay, uh, uh, Android development. Okay. Okay. Well. Okay. What, what, what will you do? Okay. When, when you see a message like this. <laughs> okay. Especially. Okay. Did 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 we talk? So. Okay. Would you? Okay. Click the. Click online for solution. And in fact, if you click it, basically, okay, it will barely offer you the solution, but instead, it was uh, send a crash report. To our, to our central database, and this is our, my okay, second piece of work. And okay, I collect the, the, the crash results, and then um, try to analyze okay, the stack traces. And these stack traces will automatically try to okay, reconstruct the execution. Okay, it's uh, very tense. Okay, uh, and then okay, based, on, based on this okay, trace analysis, we identified okay, where, where the bugs are. And okay, let's say, okay, this is another, okay, uh, award. And uh, 
Okay, my, my grand challenge with the string is, okay, if you use, okay, uh, the stack overflow, so we are, we are okay, working on uh, some, okay, uh, robot on stack overflow. Our target is, okay, try to answer the unanswered question at stack overflow. And we, this is what we, we want. We want to get the batch. All right, okay, this finishes my talk. Thank you. So I work in computational geometry, and uh, to give you some flavor of my work today, I'm going to talk about the approximate nearest neighbor problem. So let's look at the exact nearest neighbor problem first. So in this problem, you have a set of n points, and you have to pre-process these points, construct a data structure, so that uh, when you're given a query point, you can very quickly find the data point that is closest to it. So in this picture, Q is the query point, and uh, P star is the nearest neighbor of Q. So in this problem, you know, we make a few assumptions. We assume in our work that the dimension D is small, a constant. Dimension D is small, like between 2 and 20. The number of points N, you may think of it like 1 million. Uh, we use the Euclidean <coughs> metric to measure distances. And the goal is, the ideal goal would be, you know, to construct a data structure that uses order N space and achieves logarithmic log n query time. Unfortunately, such a goal is not possible to achieve for nearest neighbor, except in very small dimensions, such as one and two. So what you do? Well, researchers have turned to, you know, looking at the approximate nearest neighbor problem. We want to make the problem a bit easier. So we look at the approximate nearest neighbor problem. So now, if Q is the query point in this figure, P is the approximate nearest neighbor of Q, because the distance between P and Q is only a little bit more than the distance between Q and its nearest neighbor, which is P star. So if the distance between Q and P is one plus epsilon times the distance between Q and its nearest neighbor, then we call this a one plus epsilon approximate nearest neighbor. So we have an approximation parameter epsilon now in this problem. So for this problem, we gave a data structure in 1998, which does achieve linear space or n space and log in query time. Uh, so the data structure is based on combining the best properties of you know, KD trees and quad trees. And we get a hierarchical data structure. And uh, given a query point, we quickly find the cell. We descend the tree, find the cell that contains the query point. And then we look around the neighboring cells till we are sure that we have found the approximate nearest neighbor. So the running time is you know, log n plus this term is important, one over epsilon to the power of d. So if you think of epsilon as fixed, the query time is linear, it's linear space and log n query time, which is, achieves our goal, okay? However, it also raises some new issues. So you have an epsilon de dependent term, this one over epsilon to the power of d. This is very large, this is very important, and it affects the practical running time. So we would like to reduce this term, one over epsilon to the power of d term. And Moreover, you know, we would like to ask, you know, can we, by giving it a little bit more space, by using more space in the data structure, can we reduce the query time? Can we reduce this epsilon dependent term? So in 2001, Harpelet gave a very different way of solving this problem based on approximate Warner diagrams. And this data structure is again a quartile like subdivision of space. In this, every cell stores a representative point. And this representative point is the approximate nearest neighbor for any query point in the cell. So all you have to do is descend the tree, find the cell that contains the query point, look at the representative point in the cell, and output it. So of course, now the query time is extremely fast. It's logarithmic in n and 1 over epsilon. It's extremely fast. But the space has gone up to n times 1 over epsilon to the power of t. So in 2001, we had these three solutions for solving the approximate nearest neighbor problem, achieving different trade-offs between space and query time. But the interesting thing was that for all of them, if you take the product of the space and the query time, you get this n times 1 over epsilon to the power of d. So you know, we thought, well, this must be the right answer for this problem, that this must be the best space query time possible. And all we had to do was to get a continuous space time trade-off, because these are three different methods. We want to achieve everything using the same method, all, all, all possible continuous trade-offs. So 
Here was an idea. Use approximate Wannett diagrams, but instead of just storing one representative for each cell, store a number of representatives for, these cell, for each cell, and one of these representatives should work as the approximate nearest neighbor. So we descend the, cell, descend the tree, find the cell that contains the query point, and look at all the representatives in this cell, and one of them will be the, will be the answer to the query. So by so doing, the surprise that we got was that using space order n, we brought the query time down to 1 over epsilon to the power of d by 2. So the space query time product is now just n times 1 over epsilon to the power of d by 2, which broke the barrier, this n, to the n times 1 over epsilon to the power of d barrier. Mm -hmm. It's still an open problem how to obtain the best space time trade-offs, and we are still working on it. Thank you. So I'm told that I have to give a talk like talk. So uh, this is not a technical talk. So unlike any of my previous talks, so no equations. And uh, <laughs> so I'm going to talk about the life lessons from machine learning. So the first thing that I learned is that, well, you have to make life simple. OK, so you may have heard of uh, survival of the fittest. OK, so in, this is what the biologists tell us. Well, but as a machine learner, so what I tell you is that's to not overfit, okay? So this is Machine Learning 101. And of course, besides Machine Learning 101, well, we have a lot more things to make your life easier. So how to do this? So what we do is to use something called the regularizers. So basically, you have a complex model. We don't like complex models. We try to penalize models that are too complex. How to do this? Well, again, a few very simple life lessons. First thing, own less, live more. What that means? in machine learning terms, sparsity, okay? That means that you have a long parameter vector, okay? You don't really need to walk, you don't really need to use that many parameters, okay? You want to have a sparse solution. You want to have a lot of, of zeros, okay? And uh, of course, sparsity, so we have a lot of different kinds of sparsity, uh, regularizers, in particularly, well, recent years we are working on so with structured sparsity, um, which is very useful and uh, in a lot of applications. Another thing, which is also very useful is be humble, okay? So what does that mean? That means that, well, don't want to get a high rank, okay? Don't be department head, don't be associate <laughs> department head, okay? So do low rank, okay? Low rank, very useful, okay? So when you're talking about matrix problems, tens of problems, always do low rank, okay? Second question, okay, second lesson, live life simple. So making your life simple is not good enough, you have to live it, okay? You have to carry this out. In machine learning terms, that means that, well, you have a model, you have to find the model parameters, okay? So we call this optimization. So we have a lot of optimization methods, Newton's method, cutting plane, sum definite program, and so on and so on. So however, to live life simple, what we are doing, machine learners are doing, great in the sense, okay? So you have a curve like this, very simple. You are at a certain point, just find the descent direction, pick a certain step size, just do it, okay, descent. And interestingly, this is one of the most popular optimization softwares nowadays. It's especially good for big data because it is very scalable. Good. So <laughs> that life is stochastic. Okay. So this is a picture of the Hang Seng Index in the recent six months. So you can see that it jumps from uh, 2, uh, 23,000 to uh, close to uh, 30,000, and then after a few weeks, go back to below 22,000. Okay, so this is life. So what can we do? So again, well, machine learners will tell you that, well, very simple, make it less stochastic. Okay, so uh, in recent years, we are interested in things like called variance reduction. Okay, so when you do gradient descent, in particular stochastic gradient descent, so there will be a lot of stochastic noise, and uh, so we are using techniques to try to reduce the variance, so that Intuitively, the stochastic gradient is closer to the deterministic gradient. And uh, unfortunately, life is not smooth. Okay, so uh, what can we do? The good news is that long smoothness is good. Okay, so what we found out is that well, when you when we use long smooth laws or long smooth regularizers, often that can lead to better performance. So, say for example, instead of using a squared laws, maybe you can use some hinge laws. You can use well, more complicated laws. Regularizers, we also have a lot of complicated regularizers, not only non-smooth, but also non-convex, like these ones. So they lead to better performance, but of course, well, 
the machine learning that will lead to more challenging problems. But uh, fortunately, we have tools for that. And uh, another thing is, don't be too calculative, okay? The point is, well, just like uh, Sunil just said, well, no need to get exact solutions in real life. Approximate solutions are almost always good enough, okay? <laughs> and uh, finally, well, teamwork. Well, it's often too difficult for just one single of us to bear all the tasks. So the good news the machine learning is that, well, now do distributed algorithms. So you have service, and then you can ask more workers to help you. And moreover, well, there's no need to, to wait for everybody. Just like the seminar, okay, so, well, so you can come and go, and right? <laughs> so encourage asynchrony. So the conclusion, yes, okay, all this. Thank you. <laughs> my research uh, 12 years ago. Um, so uh, we are trying to, to build computing tools in the hospital, in the surgical room, to help physicians to, uh, to carry out uh, a surgery that, or treatment. And this is the, normally the setting, uh, how, they, how they view the images. And uh, the, the patient uh, was lying on the bed, and this is the Siemens, uh, I'm sorry, Philips, <laughs> Philips uh, X-ray machine, and all those are the images. So th now the question is, how can we use computer vision image processing techniques to visualize the, the images better? Or before you see this, can you do some prediction or some uh, planning before you, you carry out the uh, sur surgery? So this is one example I, I would like to highlight. As we also have been working for 10 years is to treat uh, blood vessel and, and vascular diseases. And the one problem is uh, the lumbar vessel, it, it is a tube. And for the abnormal part is the balloon. Uh, attach on the on the tube, right? So the blood go inside and comes out, uh, and it creates a lot of pressures on the on the blood circular wall, uh, the vascular wall. So uh, when it bursts, it will have very serious internal bleeding. Uh, the name for this disease is the aneurysm. Second is the narrowing. It's the opposite. It's the lumbar pipe. Uh, it looks like this: a lumbar blood vessel, and in the middle, and there is a narrowing of the of the lesion. Uh, the third one is the abnormal. Uh, blood vessel everywhere inside the brain. So how to treat it uh, is to put some coils inside the, uh, the, the aneurysm, to pack the aneurysm with the coils. Normally you need four or five coils. Now the problem is how can you pick the best coil? If the coil is too small, the coil will come out, will block the blood vessel. It will have another problem because you are breathing, you are, you're preventing blood from uh, going to other part of the body. If the coil is too big, and then the aneurysm will, will burst. So you need to pick the right coil, and also coil is quite expensive. So uh, at that time, I decided to use um, uh, image processing technique to help to build a 3D model from the images usually acquired before the treatment. So before the treatment, you see this image. Usually it's not very clear because to, uh, to, to save scanning time, because scanner usually is fully packed, schedule is easy. And also uh, the, the signals actually are, very, are not very strong. So we managed to uh, to enhance the signal and also build this 3D model. So this is what we have been doing, is to help the physicians, uh, clinicians have better vision and better view on the, on the part inside the body. So before 3D modeling, then you see this, and afterwards then you see 3D model. Then you can, uh, actually you can manipulate it, you can view it and measure it. Uh, actually there are, uh, are, are in commercial uh, packages, they provide this kind of um, uh, software to, to view that. We try to build something uh, very different. 
so if we find any software in, in these packages, we try to build something you cannot find from there. So, uh, so these are the examples we have been working for the past 10 years with the students. Uh, is to use graphics to put virtual tube uh, so that you can find the abnormal part in the, in the uh, blood vessel. And this is the aneurysm, right? two virtual tubes, and outside is the abnormal part. For the stenosis, as you, put, you put one virtual tube, and everything uh, between the tube and the blood vessel is the abnormal part. Then you can use it for planning. So we have been helping many cases in the hospital in Hong Kong, and these are a few examples, and we published in the clinical journals. So uh, a giant aneurysm and small one, and also stenosis. Others to find many, uh, my background is also object uh, detection. You try to find many objects inside images like the blood vessels and you can automate the entire process before the treatment uh, or surgery. Uh, so these are the few examples. And very recently, we start to use machine learning. I know it's not easy, uh, <laughs> life is not easy. And then the deep learning uh, to find uh, structure deep inside brain. So we use deep learning to find deep structure inside brain. It's, it turns out very useful. And my student just got a best paper award last week in the deep learning uh, workshop uh, based on all those uh, clever ideas maybe from your course. Okay, so, uh, so thank you very much. And these are my sharings. Thank you. I'm Raymond Bond. Uh, my topic is Big Data Analytics on Big Spatial Database. Do you know what is the hot topic in June and July uh, last year, 2014? If you forget it, uh, this is the World Cup. And uh, do you know which country won the World Cup? I think you still remember Germany. And the final match in World Cup 2014, Germany versus Argentina, and this is 1 to 0. And also, I think you also remember the semi final match in World Cup 2014. Germany versus Brazil is seven to one. I think this is a we met. Okay, do you know why Germany won the World Cup 2014? It's related to big spatial data. Okay, <laughs> the Germany Football Association DBF found SAP, SAP to develop an application called Match Inside, a spatial processing tool. Each player puts a sensor <laughs> under his sock. The receiver in the football match receives the current location. Okay. This analyzes a large amount of data about the members of the German team and their opponents based on their on-field performance. And the tools also visualize and analyze all the video or record of, uh, uh, from our team to know how they play in the football matches. The two also give some uh, strategy to the German team, how to play with other teams in a smart way. In other words, each German player is instructed and no player will show off in match. And here is some statistic in 2014, according to the tools, the coach finds that uh, the average ball possession for the team member is about 3.4 seconds, which is too long. And then according to the match inside, and then they do some analytics, and then finally they uh, have uh, reduced this number to 1.1 seconds. And now we know our successful story uh, of using big data, big sp uh, spatial data. Let's see some mobile applications. Okay, we can see there's a lot of mobile applications in your mobile devices. There's at least 500 mobile devices uh, in your mobile uh, devices. And let me talk about some services. Search nearby. I think you know that we want to find something nearby. And this is uh, one uh, uh, well-known application yet or open rise in Hong Kong. We want to search nearby some restaurant near Hong Kong USD. We also have some other application, for example, Foursquare, Go Gowala, and all we have the search nearby. And these are my previous work about search nearby, keyword search, uh, hyper fierce dominance, and a keyword query, and some bichromatic reverse nearest neighbor related to search nearby. And now let me go to the second uh, uh, service, spatial cloud sourcing. And this is uh, uh, cloud sourcing is a platform where people post tasks and some other people perform tasks. And each task is associated with a location, and workers need to go to the location physically in order to perform the task. And for example, taking a video clip at the Times Square of New York. For example, this is the three mission, and then we want to post a new task. Here we want to uh, go to the campus, and then we want to take a picture of a uh, firebird. And there's an other application, for example, local hands, uh, as tasker, okay. And these are my two previous work, for example, worst case matching and spatial matching. And now, let me go to the uh, first surface. We want to record the trace of a movement, and we want to sample the position of the trace periodically. And you can see this is our app, Max Plus, and we can see there's a trace here. 
we also have night key plus we also have one keeper i'm using this uh, application for running to record my trades and here is some of my previous work about that trajectory simplification now go to the last uh, surface shortest distance and here we want to find the shortest distance i think you used the google map before for example starting from here to destination we want to find our shortest path and these are my previous uh, uh, publication related to this shortest distance query and then point to point distance query and some other uh, things related to shorter distance query. Uh, let me conclude my talk. We have these four services. Thank you. So I found by doing so, I saved some seconds. Right. Um, we've never been so excited about doing research on big data. Uh, just Raymond introduced a part of it. Um, but the question is that uh, where is big data? Right. Um, social media actually cover a lot of things. Uh, you use WhatsApp, you use Facebook, you use Weibo, you use uh, Twitter. So social media cover a lot of topics and information, and there's a lot of data, and it appears everywhere. Um, one typical example of social media is microblog. Um, in Chinese version, we call it blog. So uh, microblogs allow users to post some short content, which also manage a lot of relationship between one user and another. So there is um, a lot of facilities provided by such microblog. For example, so a user is able to link with other user with follow, mention, and retreat. So who really used Twitter? Um, <coughs> this is the data in 2015. You can see that um, there are over 300 million monthly active users, which is mean a lot of users using it. Um, nearly 600 million tweets sent per day. Um, in the US, 23% uh, of online elder users use Twitter, a quite substantial number people using it. Uh, importantly, you see that um, the number of young users is quite important because the data skew towards younger users. Young means that um, younger than 30 years old. Uh, so I think I'm not young anymore. Uh, so they saw that um, the Twitter is very important and it's really big data and it becomes bigger in future according to the users. Um, what's the use of uh, tweet information? Now, there are 2 billion search queries per day in 2015. Unlike web search, the information in Twitter contains mostly timely information. So for example, uh, those information related to news, trends, events, uh, weather forecast, working news, social information such as uh, celebrities, public opinions, um, and topical information, uh, less than uh, the products about Apple, iPhone, etc. So they're more focused. Um, Twitter comes very fast. Um, according to the data I have, so there are 6,000 tweets per second. So if I uh, give the talk now, so there are 1,000 million trees already posted um, in microblog. For a given topic like uh, iPad, if you search iPad uh, using the search <coughs> facilities provided by Twitter, so we found that uh, around 50 new trees mentioning the keyword iPad in the moment. Many of the um, Tweets are low quality. Some are use useful information, but, but some just contain some slangs um, or some strange symbols. So not all of them are really useful. So um, I would like to highlight um, three research issues uh, we are doing. So I just label it A, B, C. Okay. A stands for analysis in microblogs. So how do we analysis? microblog content. 
Now, the traditional um, techniques like um, test analysis are useful, but I think one important um, feature set is about the link based features. The link based features represent the repetition of the link quality. For example, uh, what is the quality of the retreat, the pie treat? Um, a high quality treat uh, always linked with another high quality treat. So the user post high quality treat is likely to reply or mention some high quality treat user. And also the high quality websites uh, is very likely to be referred by high quality treats. He represents uh, broadening data semantics. So how do we uh, broaden, uh, understand the data semantics? Now, S3 is very short, so we need to advise the topic model. So some um, uh, semantics like Arabic revolutions using a bunch of keywords may not be sufficient to represent semantics. So we need to enrich more semantics by using the auxiliary model. Finally, uh, how do we make the search more personalized? So as a user in Twitter, so he used to be they have many different roles, information producer, consumer, and seeker. So we need to identify different kind of user model. We don't contain all the topics in one model. We differentiate each of them and uh, differentiate uh, different parts of all the different layers. Okay, so I think this is a bring home message for you. Um, so for ABC and also Microsoft Search, it's a very important kind of searching data. Thank you. research on internet-based computing and uh, data center network. I'm not going to I'm not going to give you a summary of my previous work because it's too much. I've been here like quite a while after I realized that it is like almost 20 years. I mean my area primarily on computer networking and communication and uh, which over the years have covered a lot of uh, spectrum from our vacation to transport layer, from sensor data to, to link level transmission, full parallel computing, and all of that. And uh, I have done, um, made a, several contributions, probably I consider the most important one is, is in the area of video, uh, video broadcast or video streaming on the internet, which, which happened to on this year, Infocom uh, Test of Time Award, which actually was published in, in 10 years ago, 2005, and, and actually I got a lot of investment uh, in 2006, tens of millions of dollars US uh, to, to start up a company which, which, which unfortunately is not successful in the end. And I got a few work over the years. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about my current research focus basically on, I, I call internet-based computing, commonly referred as cloud computing. I think cloud computing is a term is too, a little bit too narrow. And also the underlying infrastructure which we call data center networking. Um, cloud computing or internet-based computing, really this, this word computing I think somehow is a little bit misleading because this platform offers much more than just computing, okay? It's, it's offer massive capacity and a tremendous amount of services and, and it is support like your daily news and a web search, online games, social media, and, and a video streaming and all of that. Okay, so all of those services over the internet, they really need a, a gigantic or, or enormous computing and communication engine behind that. And that's where, where the cloud computing and, and, and the data center network comes into play. Let me take an example of Google, by the way. This is, I, I think, is probably the best design of the uh, data center uh, in the world, which started in 2000. 2006, which about nine years ago, Google invested about 1.6 billion US dollar, which is the amount of money actually Tencent, QQ, Tencent is actually trying to invest right now, starting from this year and in the next five years. 1.6 billion US, US dollars, that's what Google invested nine years ago. This are built data center in, in different locations of the world, which, which as of today, in, in to my data is a little bit updated, December last year, which, which is about 14 data centers, two of them located in Asia, one is in Taiwan and Singapore. And the number of servers, I want to emphasize, the number of servers right now, if it's 
if it's not a surprise, this can get close to four million servers, which is a lot. If you talk about 14 locations, which is about 300,000 servers and machines in a single location, each of that consume a lot of power, a lot of uh, energies, and, and require huge compound uh, of infrastructures, and which host to this data center network, which, which, which is a lot. Okay? If you look a little bit detail inside, this is a very densely connected network which is completely, I could say, completely opposite of internet. So there were a lot of research has to be redoing, redone for this type of network in the data center. For example, this is densely connected. How do you do routing is gonna be different with the internet. How do you transport traffic is actually quite different from, from, from uh, internet. Another thing is one of the dominant computing paradigm is, is something called the data parallel computing, which, which everybody talk about big data. This is the computing framework for that. And this is a popular for many applications, web search and a social network algorithm or page ranking and all, all of that. And one of the key issue here is that you're going you're gonna to run this so-called data parallel computing job in hundreds of thousands of machines on, on inside the data center network. How do you allocate resources properly? How do you actually move the data among those uh, tasks on different, different hundreds of thousands of machines. That's one of the concerns, I, uh, one of the research I'm doing right now. If you look a little bit closer, and uh, this actually, there, if you take a map reduce, for example, parallel, popular, one of the popular data f parallel uh, framework, which you, you have hundreds of machines processing the data, then transmit to the next stage, continue processing, and so on and so forth. So there's a lot of constraint on the network. You have to do some kind of a constraint scheduling on the network capacity and everything. And also, if you do this over the internet, and, and uh, this, this is tremendous difficult because you know, it doesn't guarantee actually the amount of traffic you send gonna reach there in time. All right, and last but least, and uh, for this kind of network, actually control is quite different. We use a notion of software-defined uh, network, which the idea is you, you separate the control and, and the data actually in the network, where the data, of course, you send in packets. The control is how do you do traffic engineering, how do you control the network diagnosis, and all of that, which are, are the recent, uh, recent focus of my research. Thank you. Imagine that you want to translate a sentence from English to Chinese, and then so you find up your Google Translate and type in the so English sentence. So for example, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. And in fraction of a second, you get a Chinese translation, whether you, you, you or not you like it. Um, now, this is an example of a sequence to sequence learning problem. And uh, the problem is not trivial because uh, Oftentimes, you need to understand the, the meaning of the source sentence and then try to uh, use the language rules in the target sentence and construct it. And there's a multiple ways of translating that. Some are better than others. For example, you might not be happy with the, the one given by Google Translate, and this might, might be a better one. From a machine learning point of view, and this problem is to learn a model to process sequential data. Both the input and output are sequential data, uh, sequences in, the, in this case. And then you need to learn a uh, model of states that are hidden and then the, the states will depend on previous states and also the current input. Now, this is only a simplification of the, the true picture because uh, a lot of the times and in real applications, the uh, output for a given, a given time may not be available. And then you need to, for example, sometimes to have some missing data or even uh, like language translation cases, the order may also be involved in different sentences. In the next uh, three and a half uh, minutes, what I'm going to flip, uh, flip through is uh, a couple of my ongoing research projects that are actually very different, but still put under the same framework of sequence to sequence learning. And uh, except for the, very, uh, the first one, the others involve the patterns that are spatial, tem uh, spatial tempo in nature. So the first one, which uh, I think the next speaker at TC will also talk a bit uh, related to that, is that uh, we try to predict the, the performance of students in uh, massive open online courses. 
Now, for this course, a lot of times that you have uh, tens of thousands of students, and any time there are thousands of students participating actively, and it's very difficult to monitor the, the progress. So what we want to do is that uh, by monitoring a profile, a learning profile, like for example, video watching activity and uh, the forum participations and the submissions of uh, assessment tasks and so on, we try to predict the performance at uh, some point in the future or at the end of a course. So what do we want it for? We want to be able to identify some underperforming uh, students and to provide help if uh, possible. Uh, the next one is a collaboration uh, uh, with the Hong Kong Observatory. Now, in Hong Kong, in every six minutes, uh, so there's a radar map, radar echo map collected in the region about 200 uh, kilometers by 200 kilometers. Of, uh, basically, you want to know the clouds, the pattern, and then use it to predict the rainfall intensity in the next couple of hours. So um, here, we, uh, we have the input patterns there, and then uh, build a model. Compared with the existing uh, uh, algorithm, this is based on uh, optical flow methods, we get a better result, and we're working with them to actually eventually use them in their system. The next one is a tracking problem. So in the video here, you can see that we're playing a video, and then the different trackers, ours are of course the best. <laughs> so you're identifying an object that's moving. In the first frame of the video, the, the location is given. In later frames, what you need to do is to track the, the objects over time. So this is a challenging problem, and then because uh, we also have a ch uh, uh, significant change in intensity, we have occlusion and so on. So this problem here can also be formulated as a sequence to sequence learning problem. HKUST is the first research university in Hong Kong. The last one here. Being here, science and engineering. Suppose I want to uh, have a video uh, taken using my very not too smartphone. And then I want to display on a 50-inch uh, TV, 4K technology, nice uh, video quality. So what do you do is uh, do this video super resolution. So given this uh, low quality video, you get a high quality one. Uh, uh, I just want to clarify that this is not given by our current algorithm. I downloaded this from the HUSC website, downsample that, add an arrow there, so that we can get this one. So HUSC is the first research university in Hong intended to show you that some computer science professors are still interested in education in addition to research. Uh, advances in e-learning has led to transformative uh, changes in the landscape of education at all levels, from K-12 to higher education to professional and uh, continued education. And um, the shift from teacher center to learner center pedagogy has led to increasing emphasis on active and collaborative learning. Instead of offering teaching and learning just in brick and mortar institutions, more courses are now being offered as blended learning mode, as well as massive open online courses on MOOC. On the technology side, access to high quality multimedia and open learning resources has become more prevalent availability of learning management system and social media platforms has facilitated better collaboration between teachers and learner. Big data and cloud computing are enabling technology that allow vast amount of data to be collected from online and MOOC platforms. The convergence of these pedagogical and technological development has led to new research challenges in learning analytics, knowledge mining, as well as media and uh, virtual reality tools for teaching and learning. Well, I assume that all of you know what is MOOC, uh, but I want to point out that MOOC go beyond just the offering of courses and content because MOOC platform can collect the rest of our, all the activities from the learner. It allows users, uh, allow teachers to better understand how students learn and, and how teachers can improve their teaching and learning. HKUST is a pioneer in the MOOC uh, movement. Uh, 
we joined um, uh, Coursera, which is the largest platform as the first university from Asia. We have offered five courses so far. Recently, two professors from Michigan UST are now offering a series of book on full stack web development, which is funded by Coursera. We are also a partner of Ethics, which is uh, founded by MIT and Harvard. And so far, we have offered uh, six courses in this area. And if you look at the number of enrollment, we already have over 350,000 learners uh, from these uh, 10 MOOC offered by HKUSD, including my own MOOC on Java programming. I now have over 100,000 uh, students from around the world. Well, um, you can see that um, we can do learning analytics on uh, the MOOC data thanks for, for the uh, uh, visualization system developed by Huaman's research group. For example, here you can see a lot of activities here. If you click on uh, the location, you see that the topic being discussed is data abstraction. And you know that data abstraction is a concept that's difficult to grasp, especially for uh, the beginning programmer. So we want to develop methods for automatically extracting these kind of pattern in order to enhance the learning experience of students. Here is some analysis on the uh, social, uh, social network analysis on the discussion forum. I, I think I'll just skip that. Uh, a second area is the knowledge mining from lecture video. As you know, video is the largest source of um, uh, uh, media that you find uh, for delivering uh, online uh, teaching and learning material. By using multimodal analysis on video, audio, as well as textual content, we are developing a system that could facilitate the search of concept in a lecture video corpus and also to extract the relationship between concepts so that uh, we can deliver effective learning strategy for individual learners. The um, third area is in the air, is in a developing system that would uh, deliver multimedia and virtual reality tools for uh, e-learning. Uh, we are using a model called uh, work which is based on four sensory modality uh, namely visual, audio, reading and writing, as well as uh, kinesthetic. The system can be developed to allow uh, multimedia content and posting to be used according to the individual's uh, learning style. For example, here in this system, uh, we are using a uh, Microsoft Kinect together with the uh, NVIDIA 3D glasses and 3D display to develop an immersive 3D collaborative learning environment so that learner can uh, interact with each other with each other in a, a more um, collaborative, collaborative way. Thank you. So please don't start yet. <laughs> I'm the last one. I hope you, you guys don't have too much information overflow already. But <laughs> I'll try to be fast. There are a lot of slides. Okay. So I'm Pedro Sander, I'm on the vision and graphics group, and I work mostly on problems related to rendering and imaging in general, and I'll cover a few of those examples. So graphics have come a long way from the beginning. In the early days, this is how we used to render Pac-Man. We can now render it a little bit like this, right? We can add more complexity and more co complex shading effects when rendering uh, objects in real time. So a lot of the work that I do involves rendering optimization which is how do you render scenes better, either in terms of quality or in terms of efficiency to be able to render faster uh, different, different kinds of scenes of three-dimensional synthetic scenes, right? So that's one side of the things that I work on more, more early on. In other areas that I've been working more recently have been related to imaging techniques, which is basically how to process images. And usually, uh, there are a couple of projects that I did on this, usually dealing with lots of large amounts of data or complex manipulation of real-world image data. So, these are kind of two different directions that I focused on. Uh, so for the rendering problem, which is how to draw the pixels on the screens, on the screen given a, a representation, a 3D representation. On that area, I worked on several problems since the early days. I started working on um, mostly on how to render.
geometry rendering efficiently, and then also how to do the shading, so you can see the shadows, the lighting, and so on. Every pixel on the screen is colored differently, so how to determine the color of every pixel is also an interesting problem, and it varies a lot depending on the materials that we have. So for example, if we have skin, human skin, it's a different algorithm to try to render that well than if you have, for example, this gem or this diamond. So how to design algorithms to render different materials fast in real time is essentially one of these directions that I've been working on through the years. And the other direction is imaging. So with imaging, this is the very first image that was taken, the very first photograph is from 1820. So you can see that we've, we went a long way since then. And one of the projects that I worked on uh, has been on generating gigantic images and coming up with software to process them. So this is an example of a huge image that we developed. Uh, we did this in around 2010, and at the time was the largest image in the world. And it's composed of rendering a bunch of smaller images and combining them into a gigantic one. So we can see a visual example of it. You can zoom in to the image, and you'll be able to see there is a, a duck there, or, or whatever animal that was. <laughs> And you can see we're zooming to a different area. Now you can see a church. That was where one of my friend's wedding was, was, in, was, in, was on that church. Uh, but it allows you to essentially uh, capture a lot of detail from a very big picture by just taking several images and, and combining them. So that's one area. A completely different project, just to give two different examples, have to do with processing smaller images, just regular images, and morphing between them. So if you have, for example, an image of the circle, and you want to morph it into an image of a star, we had to come up with an, an algorithm, an optimization, that would be able to align the details between those two images. And we came up with a few semi-automatic methods to do this transition efficiently. Uh, and I'll skip this one because of time. So, uh, so basically, this is one example. So it's morphing between a picture and a caricature of the person. So you can see the transition. And this was done with very little user intervention. Uh, it's mostly automatic, the, the matching and the processing of the, of the features. Uh, this is morphing from a satellite image to uh, a picture. And these, by the way, take one or two seconds to compute the, the matching and the morphing, and it's per pixel uh, morphing. This is a human into a lizard, so it's quite interesting. Uh, this is, uh, we, we, we made a frequency decomposition of the scene of the two images, two input images, so we can combine low frequencies of one with high frequencies of the other. So this is traversing the 4D space of possible combinations of frequencies uh, of the two images. So you can get very interesting transitions. So this assumes a given mapping and is just working on different ways of computing transitions. And we came up with some different techniques to do that. And this shows a butterfly from, um, uh, from two butterflies, you can create a variety of different butterflies uh, from that. And last example that I'd like to show, and I know I'm running out of time, <laughs> is that of video morphing. So these are just uh, an extension of the algorithm to 3D. In images, it's a 2D mapping. In videos, we have the time dimension. So you have to create a, a 3D mapping between the two. It made it much more complex. But with tracking of features and uh, be able to specify some points, we can create very interesting transitions for that as well. Okay, so given that my time's expired, I'll, I'll stop here. Thank you. Wow, okay, very interesting talks. Uh, okay, um, in fact, okay, this is the first time that I learned uh, from Raymond how to do, okay, issue nine in eight seconds. So, okay, Raymond's, okay, only spent four minutes to go through that, 30 slides. <laughs> okay, uh, okay. May I ask you, okay, all of you to give uh, applause to, to our speakers today. Okay. <laughs> right. Um, okay, we, we have a couple of minutes for questions. Anyone would like to raise questions to our okay, speakers? Yes? I would like to ask uh, Mr. Raymond. Uh, Raymond? Okay, yes. Yeah. Oh, 
the applications, uh, we want to find the shortest path on the terrain surface. And usually, uh, we have uh, a lot of applications. For example, uh, uh, we can build a road and also uh, find some uh, monitor the animal on the terrain. Uh, 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 it's also an application of game, yes. OK, thank you. OK, thank you. OK, uh, any classmates would like to okay, raise another question? Okay. If not, okay, okay, next, okay, uh, close our seminar here and we are serving refreshments outside. And okay, uh, please, okay, feel free to enjoy the, our refreshment and mingle with our faculty members. Thank you.